All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 2150 Object Orientation. Today, uh, I would like to uh, keep working on the worked example that we've got. So the very first thing that I want to do with that is kind of remind you of the state that we were in at the end of last class. I want to take this worked example all the way through uh, using a feature of Java called generics. Um, but just for total clarity, generics are not part of this course. Uh, I, I just personally think that they are important enough that I want to tell you about them, but you will not be assessed on your use of generics in any way. And you're not expected to use generics in any way. I just want to make sure that you see them before you are abruptly introduced to them in third year without any context. After we get through the worked example, what I'd like to do is switch gears entirely and start taking a look at C++. One of the goals that we've got, some of the goals that we've got for C++ uh, for our starting look at it is really just to be able to write a small class in C++ and to be able to compile multi-file uh, classes and not really much more than what we've been doing in C. We're not even going to get to like extending classes in our first hack at C++. I really just want to get us comfortable with the structure and with the syntax uh, and the approach to compiling the code that we have for C++. So I already did this, so I don't really need to tell you that. Uh, let's, uh, let's remind ourselves where we were with this worked example at the end of last class. So our goal is that we're trying to build a bank. We're trying to build a, a bank. And here is the structure that we've got, the class hierarchy that we've got. We started with this bank account and the savings account and checking account hierarchy. That was one of the first hierarchies that we built with our um, code. And then we added to that this idea of a node. We're starting to build up this linked list structure. And the purpose for the linked list structure was that we wanted to have this class called a bank, where the bank is going to have a collection of account objects. The goal, ultimately, that we have with bank is that we wanted to have this list of accounts. We want it to be able to print accounts, and we want it to be able to add accounts. But we don't really care about what kind of account it is. We don't want to have those separate lists for each kind of account that we have in this system. We really just want to be able to represent all accounts in one list. This was the structure that we had. And here's the code that we wrote. So we've got this public class bank. Checking account, savings account, and bank account, they didn't change at all. We didn't make any changes to those classes last time. We were just using them as they were before. Our bank account has a private instance variable that is the head of our list of accounts. This is going to be the collection of all accounts. We've got this uh, default constructor. This is also called a null constructor, one that doesn't take any arguments. This is just the constructor that you don't pass any input to. When we initialize this list, we're setting that accounts list to null, so we don't have any accounts in this system. When we add a new account, we're always inserting at the front of the list, so we don't have to worry about the head node being null because we're just always inserting to the front of the list. We don't have to do anything with this.head equals this.head.next equals whatever. We just make the new thing the head of the list. We've got this method that's called print, and that just prints out all of the accounts. So it starts printing the head node, and then the nodes themselves are calling print in succession on each other. The node class itself is here, and the structure of this is that we have two main properties. We've got the bank account. So this is the actual data that we want to store in this node. We've got the next node in the list. We've got a single constructor that takes two arguments, the node that we want to have as next and the account that we want to store in this list, uh, in this list item. We've got a method getNext so that we can iterate over the list if we want to. 
And then importantly, we've got this print method that will print out the, the value of this node, whatever bank account type is in this node. And if this node has a next, it's going to call the print method on that next node. So head prints itself and then calls print on next. Next prints itself, calls print on next. Next prints itself, calls print on next. And then it's null, so we stop printing. At the very end of the class last time, we had the kind of culmination of all of the structure is that I want to be able to create this new instance of bank and I want to be able to add some accounts to it. I want to be able to add different kinds of accounts to it. And internally, that bank, that list itself, doesn't know anything about the kinds of accounts that it's printing out. It just wants to blindly call print. And then polymorphism, through polymorphism, we've got different print methods or different two-string methods on these account classes. The appropriate one is called based on the type at runtime, and we're getting the correct uh, type of account printed out. So if I click this Run button, this is kind of where we feverishly ended at the end of last class, is clicking that button and like really, really hoping that it was going to work out for us, and it did. So we've got this checking account being printed out. That's the first account that we've added here. And we've got savings account being printed out. And that's the second account that we've added here. Are we okay with this? It's okay to say no. It's super okay to say no. But I'd much rather see thumbs up. Okay. Okay, good. Good. This is fine. This is fine. This is fine. The main limitation that we have right now with this list structure is that we're only allowed to put bank accounts in this. And I don't know if you remember when I was talking about C, one of those times I was talking about C, because I've talked a bunch about C. We're not even doing C in this course, and I just keep talking about it. One of the problems that we had with C was if we want to make a list for a specific type, we kind of have to just keep making new lists for all of those different types. And here, here we are, back in that exact same situation. This isn't really going to work very generally if I want to use this list class, this node class, for other things. In my ideal world, I can make this node class, I can make this structured list class, and I can have a bunch of operations on it, like inserting to the head and inserting to the tail and inserting in between nodes. And I should just be able to reuse this same list structure over and over and over again without having to create new list types for every different kind of thing that I would want to put into this list. So I want to make some changes to this. I want to be able to take this structure and be able to use any type of thing in this list. Let me motivate this example. I want to be able to have a bank. Banks are, uh, banks are places that you go to. Banks are places that you go to that you put your money in. They've got accounts. But another thing that banks have is safe deposit boxes. And I want to be able to put stuff in safe deposit boxes. So ultimately, what I want to be able to do, bear with me for a second here, Where are we right now? We're in week three, lecture five. Sample. OK. I want to be able to put my Game Boy in my safe deposit box. It's really important. It's really, really important. The line that I ultimately want to, to compile here, so I want to be able to say this dot safe deposit boxes. is equal to null.
I want to be able to add an item to my box. A box. I want to be able to put an item in a box. But I want to know, kind of, I want to be able to put anything in my box. I don't want to have to put very specific things into my savings, uh, into my, into my uh, safe deposit box. I want to be able to put anything. I want to be able to say this dot accounts list, this dot safe deposit box. Just want to be able to insert blindly stuff into my safe deposit boxes. So I'm going to have to change my node type. I'm going to ask for some feedback here. And you can just shout it out verbally. In Java, in Java, there's a class type that kind of derives them all. That's at the very top of every hierarchy in Java. It's a word, even if you haven't heard of this before, there's a word that we've used a lot. There's two words that we've used a lot in this course. Object. The other word that we've used a lot is class. That's actually also part of the class hierarchy in Java. There's a class called class. But there's one class that lives at the top of the entire hierarchy of all objects in Java. And that class is called object. Every class that you've ever written in Java extends object. Everything extends object. Everything extends object. String extends object. Arrays don't technically extend objects, but everything else extends object. Everything extends object. And if we think to this idea of we've got a static type binding and runtime or dynamic class binding, the one type, the one single type that we can use to say, I want to just put anything in here is object. So let's change our code a little bit. I'm going to take this bank account and I'm going to change this to be object. I'm now going to allow anything to go into this node. It doesn't matter what it is. I could put other nodes in this node if I wanted to. I'm going to change the type that I'm accepting here to object. And I'm going to do a little bit of changes here. I don't really want this to be called account anymore because it's not just an account, it's just whatever. So I'm going to use, I don't know, what's a good word to describe anything? What's that? Thing? Sure, thank you. Very imaginative. There's more imagination than I've got. Okay, thing. So I'm going to say this dot thing is equal to thing. I'm going to scroll down here a little bit. I've changed the name of that to thing. Okay. All right. We didn't actually have to change that much in this class. That's that's actually great. That's amazing. That's really great. I changed the type of the the object that I'm storing internally to object. So at compile time, I'm allowed to pretty much pass anything I want into this constructor now. That's great. That's really amazing. Let's go back to our bank and make some of those changes. I would like to accept anything. I'm going to accept an object here in this method. I want to add an item to a box. I'm going to put my item into this constructor. I'm going to scroll down here a little bit. 
I'm going to say bank dot add item to box. And I'm going to put my Game Boy in there. OK. Let's move up. Here's my bank. I now have two lists. I've got two lists. The way that I'm representing my lists here is just I've got that head node inside my class. I've got my list of accounts. I've got my list of items, things that are in there. I've got two methods, add account and add item to box. The add account method is still going to be bank account. I still want that to specifically be bank accounts. I want to make sure that there's only bank accounts in that list. But add item to box is going to accept anything, so any kind of type that I can put in there. Let's step through this. So on line 32 here, I'm initializing my bank. I've got a bank. I've got a bank. Yes, I've got a bank. On line 34, I'm adding an account and I'm passing it this type savings account. So this variable, this argument that we've got to this method, the static type is bank account. But our dynamic class binding, the thing that we have at runtime here, is of type savings account. But it doesn't really matter. It's, it's an object. It's a thing that I can put into this node. So when I step over this line, my list now has one bank account in it. I do the same thing here. I add another account to this bank. I now have two bank accounts in here. They're of different types, but they're in that same hierarchy. And after this line, I've got another list that I've added one single node to that has my Game Boy in it. I suppose I should print that out in the print method. Run that again. My Game Boy doesn't really have a two-string method. It's just kind of getting whatever the default two-string is. Let's add a two-string here. They're all my Game Boys. I'm going to keep adding more things to my safe deposit box. Another new Game Boy. I'm going to put the bank in a safe deposit box. I'm going to put a two string. Do I have a two string? No, I'm going to put a two string on here. Very emphatically, this is a bank. This is a bank. This is a bank. And we can put it into a safe deposit box. We've got a list structure now that can accept any type. Got this node, class. And the most important part about this is that we're using this super type that's common to everything. Everything in Java derives from objects. Everything ultimately extends objects. 
We don't write this here. We don't write extends object, but this is implied. Everything has this. Everything in Java has this extends object. OK, this is fine. This is fine. This is great. We now have a list structure that we don't have to rewrite over and over and over again. We can just use the same list structure and put different stuff inside that list structure. There's one problem with this. There's one problem that I have with this, and that is at runtime and at compile time, the only thing that I can do with nodes of this class that are instances of this node class, the only thing that I can do with the things inside this class is the behavior that's defined by object. That's it. I'm kind of limited by that. If I want to make a list that has specific behavior in the items that are inside the list, I need to define my own type that can be used to derive other classes so that I can have specific behavior in the class items that are in the items that are in the list that I want to have in this list. So I'm going to make some changes here again. This time, I'm going to do a little bit of design. So my bank has safe deposit boxes. I've got void, add item to box. I can put things in there. My node is now accepting a type of object, and we called it, it's a thing. I want to have another subtype, my own kind of class of things that I'm going to put inside this list. I'm going to call this class list item. Uh, no, don't turn off autosync. I want to have a class list item. The class list item that I have is going to be a type that I am not going to be able to call a constructor on. I don't want to be able to call a constructor on this thing. The class list item, what I want it to do is be there purely to define the behavior of the things that I want to be able to put in my list. That's what I want this class structure to be. The only thing that I'm going to put in this list item type is a method. I'm going to put this print method in it. It's a contrived example. It's a contrived thing that I'm going to want this list item to do. I want it to be able to print itself. That's all I want this thing to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change this relationship that I have between node and object, and I want it instead to be accepting of accepting classes that are of the type list item here. And I want to do that because I want to be able to rely on this behavior in the items that are being put into this list. So let's start building that. I'm going to go back to VS Code here. I'm going to create a new class. This one's going to be called list item. This class is going to be an abstract class. This is a class that I don't want to be able to make instances of. I don't want instances that are of this type. Because the only thing that this type is going to do is describe the behavior that its subclasses have. That's all I want it to do. To describe the behavior of the subclasses, I'm going to create this public method.
And I'm going to call this method, I'm going to modify this method with this abstract keyword. So hands up, really quickly, how many of you have actually seen this abstract keyword before? Where did you see it? 1020. OK, thank you, 1020. So we're reviewing this again. This abstract class is one that we can't, can't create an instance of. The method here, we don't provide a definition of this method. We're just declaring this method. So the return type with the arguments that it takes, but we're not actually providing an instant, uh, we're not actually providing a method body for this. So list item is going to be the type of class that I'm going to accept in this uh, node type. So let me change this from object to list item. And I'm going to change this now from system.out.println to just uh, this.thing.print. So those objects that I'm going to create that are in this new hierarchy, this abstract list item hierarchy, are going to have their own print method. So I can just rely on that print method existing. If I want to do this now, I have to create subtypes of this list item class, and I have to create subtypes of the list item class for the types that I want to be able to put into this list. So I'm going to create a couple more classes here. I'm going to create a new uh, list item for bank accounts. So uh, bank account list item. Bank account list item is going to extend this list item class. It's going to have a type bank account in it. And it's going to have a print method because it is implementing this abstract class. So I'm going to switch back to VS Code. I'm going to have a bank account list item. It's going to extend list item. And I'm going to have to quick fix here with uh, print. It's going to have a bank account. I'm going to have a constructor. I'm going to print. OK. This is just a wrapper. It's a tiny little wrapper class that doesn't really do much other than hold an instance of this class bank account. I'm going to go back to my bank now. And I'm going to have to make some changes here because we can no longer add accounts and we can no longer add just kind of random stuff into this list. So here I'm going to make a change here. I'm going to say new bank account list item and I'm going to put my account in that. I'm going to have to make a new type here. I'm going to call this one object list item. I'm going to have that extends list item. I'm going to have a private object here. I'm going to have this do the same thing. I'm going to go back to my bank, and here I'm going to say new object list item. OK. So our structure is now changed a little bit. We're no longer accepting object here, but we're accepting this kind of subtype that's called list item. We've inserted something into this hierarchy. We've got list item. List item is extending object, ultimately. 
everything extends object. We've added this list item class so that we can define the behavior of the things that we're putting into this list. That's all it's being used for is to define behavior of things that we want to put into this list. Why though? Why? Because it kind of just like if I click that run button, it's just gonna just gonna produce the same output. It's gonna produce identical output. Nothing will have changed. So why why are we doing this? Why are we adding this complexity? Why are we adding complexity to this? Why are we making this bigger? One of the things that we're going to be thinking about a little bit in this course, not a lot, a little bit in this course, and a lot more in Comp 3350 and software engineering, we're going to be starting to think about these things that are called software design principles. So as we're going through the process of building software and designing software, there are principles that we can follow try to adhere to that will make it so that our software is a little bit more resilient specifically to change. So we're going to have teams of people working on software. We want to make sure that when those teams of people are working on software, it's straightforward for them to make changes to the software that's there already and minimize the changes that they have to make to the software that exists. So I don't want to make changes to what's there already. I just want to be able to add more code to it to be able to do different things. Having object there was fine. It was fine. It really was fine if all we ever cared to do was call toString. If that's all we cared to do, we could just stop and then we're finished. We don't have to do anything. If we want to do anything more interesting than calling toString, on the list items that we have in this, in this list, we need to insert this extra thing. Inserting this extra thing means that I can just add new subclasses of list item to this. I don't have to make a new list. I can add one small wrapper class that descends from list item and then use that in this structure. That's the why. We'll see this again later when we're thinking about uh, design principles, software design principles. But for now, I'm just going to say you have to accept this as gospel. Building our software this way, yes, it's a little bit more complex, but it's going to be more resilient to change going forward. OK, so I'm going to stop with adding new subclasses to this. And I want to change just a little bit. So what I'm going to do is actually uh, make a copy of this. So I'm going to put two versions of the code that we're doing right now up on the course web page, what you see right now, and then the generics version, because I want to move on to generics. As I said earlier in class, uh, the generics, they're not officially part of this course. They're not actually part of this course. There's not going to be test questions on generics. It's really just, I, I think it's important that you see it at some point in your life before just being told that these things exist. So I want to show you a little bit of how to use them and the kind of structure that you, can, um, that you could use them for. So I want to reuse this same um, node type. I guess, you know, show of hands. Show of fingers. I want you to show me your fingers instead of just your hands. Just put your fists in the air like this with no fingers. If you've never seen generics before, you've never even heard anybody talking about generics. You have no idea what it is. And then put like five fingers up if you should probably come up here and tell you the class about what generics are. Or something in between if. 
Okay. Some people have heard of generics. That's what I'm seeing. Okay. Good, good. I'm, I'm sorry that this isn't really formally part of the class. There's no learning outcomes for generics, but I, like I said, I think this is important that you see it. Generics in Java are a way for you to create a class that can accept different types, but you can use static typing to describe what the type is, and you can change the type of a class at compile time so that it's going to contain different things. That's the idea. Let me give you a better example than me like shouting at you. We can define a class to be generic by using these angle brackets here. So I'm going to make, I want to make a generic node class. Inside this angle bracket, I put an identifier. The identifier is the type that I want to pass when I'm creating an instance of this object or when I'm declaring the type for this thing. Within this, I can use that type. So what I'm describing here, what this describes is, I want to have a class that is of type node, and I want to be able to specify at compile time the thing that I'm putting inside this node. That's what that's saying. When I use this node type, I'm going to go back to bank here because that's where we're declaring these nodes. What I want to be able to do is I want to say that this is a node that contains bank account. So at compile time, the static type that I'm assigning to this accounts list is now, it's a node that contains a bank account. My safe deposit boxes, this is a node that contains an object. This one is a special node that just allows Game Boys to be put in it. That's it. Because every bank should have a special room just for Game Boys. Within my node class, I want to keep using that type T. I'm going to put a T there. This is now an instance variable that's called thing, and its type is t. It doesn't have a type. It doesn't have a type until you declare an instance of this node with a type in that angle bracket. So when I define this class as a generic class, that actually doesn't have a static type yet. Its static type is t. It's only going to have a type when I do this, when I put a value in a type inside those angle brackets, when I declare another variable that's of that type. In my node class, I'm going to say that this is going to point to an instance of node that also uses the same type, T. So if I declare a node that has type bank account in it, then the next node will also be one that has type bank account in it. I want to accept just that type of thing in this constructor, and I want that node to be the same kind of thing. I'm going to say get next here is of this type, and I'm going to put this, make this back to be um, system.out.println. So I've changed this class slightly. I'm allowing you to put types inside those angle brackets, and then I'm going to use those types in the type that I declare for this. So I'm going to put this onto the side. I'm going to go to my bank account here, my bank here, and I'm going to say this is a generic type.
Oh boy. This needs to take an account. That's what I'm trying to do here. So I'm going to make this bigger. When I declared the head of my list here as bank account, a node that has bank accounts in it, I can create a new node. The two angle brackets together says, just put this type inside. So whatever it was declared with, just put that type inside there. You don't have to retype it, but you can. You can say bank account. And I'm going to put a bank account inside that. In my node here, I want this to be a generic type. And the thing that it accepts as input is an object. So whatever object happens, whatever type that class happens to be at runtime is just going to accept that as input. You can go even further than this, and you can do things like, let's go back to a node here. You can do things like t extends something and kind of say, like, I only want types in here that extend a certain type, but I'm going to leave it as just t here. You don't have to use generics in this class. It's not part of this class. I just think it's important and that you should see it before you get to, uh, to using it. You may have used generics before, unknowingly or unwittingly, if you were doing things like, um, I'm going to go down to my main method here, and doing something like list integer, this list is equal to new array list. If you've done anything like that before, you, you've used generics. OK, all right. This is exciting. This is so exciting. I know. I know. I know. I know. This is so exciting. Let's move on because it's boring as hell. We've built a bank. We've built this bank. We've used abstract classes and methods so that we can have a list type that allows us to have specific behavior in the classes that we're putting inside of that node. We've used polymorphism and dynamic dispatch in this, in this example by having all of our classes implement their own two-string method. And then when we call the two-string method on the supertype, it's ultimately calling the correct two-string method inside the class that we have uh, at runtime. OK, OK, OK. Pointers. This is super unrelated a little, but uh, I'm exhausted today. I'm really tired. My son is like eight years old. Like I said, it's really unrelatable. This is really, really unrelatable. For the last like four nights, at 2 a.m., he's waking up and he comes into my bedroom and he's like, can you tuck me in? <sighs> Why did you get out of bed? Why did you get out of bed if you want me to come and tuck you in? But yeah, that's really unrelatable. That's a really unrelatable anecdote. Let's talk about pointers. This is kind of our segue into starting to talk about C++. This is kind of our segue into talking about C++. But one of the points that I want to make, one of the points that I want to make with pointers, that was a pun unintended and just a happy coincidence. One of the points that I want to make with pointers is that pointers are really what are enabling us to do this whole polymorphism thing and enabling us to do this dynamic class binding. So being able to specify at runtime or being able to change at runtime what, what type of thing a, an instance of a class actually points at or an object actually points at. Really formally, a pointer is an object that stores a memory address. Here, it wasn't too long ago that you were learning about C. This is a small example of what a pointer is. We've got this variable b. 
b is of type integer. The value that's been bound to b is 42. You can imagine here that at address 1008, there's the number 42 inside of there. Great, excellent, good. We have this mental model of memory. A pointer in C is a variable with a specific type. Int star is a type. The type that's been bound to this variable called A is a type of pointer to integer. What I put inside of A is the address of B. Pointers in Java, but I thought Java didn't have. I thought Java didn't have pointers. We kind of do. We kind of do have pointers in Java. We just never talk about it. It's that secret, that open secret that nobody really acknowledges. Pointers are there in Java. We call them object references. And if you go all the way back to Comp 1010, you can remember, hopefully, this idea of passing by value and passing by reference. In Java, we, we implicitly have this idea of a pointer in the form of object references. Here's an example. I've beaten to death this banking account thing, but we're going to beat it to death some more. If I create this instance of a variable called mine, and I bind it to type account, and then I assign a value to that, a new checking account, created this new account, and then I create this other thing, this variable called yours, and I bind that to type bank account. And then I say yours is equal to mine. They're now the same thing. They're now the same object. Both of those things are referring to the same object. Pointers in Java are, they're implicit. When we have these object references in a class, we've got pointers, and they're kind of being used implicitly. In C, when you were doing memory allocation, you were using that malloc function. You call malloc, you get back a pointer to memory somewhere. In Java, the only way that we can get memory is by using constructors. The only way that we can get any memory is by calling new and calling the constructor method. Part of what Java is doing here is kind of forcing us to get memory that is matching a very specific type. And we're not going to have access to memory below that. We're not going to be able to do stuff with memory in any way that we want. We never have to do dereferencing. We never have to use addresses in Java. We don't ever have to think about the asterisk symbol and the ampersand symbol and then like try and desperately figure out which one you need to know where. I still don't know every time I need to do this and see. I still don't know which one I'm supposed to use every single time. In Java, when we're using pointers, we never release memory. We never ever release memory in Java. We never call a function like free. We just let things go out of scope. And the garbage collector comes around and like vacuums everything up after we're finished with it. We never have to think about this stuff with pointers in Java, but they're there. Here's a little node class. This is a node class that has just an integer value it's got some methods in it. And we've got a reference to our next object. I've got a question for you. How do you visualize this relationship?
How do you visualize that relationship? This is a little abstract, I guess. When I was in 1010, when I was a tiny little baby, no, it wasn't 1010 that I did this in. When did I first see this? I think the first time I saw it was when 2140. I remember thinking to myself, I remember thinking to myself, like, what is going on here? I remember seeing this line of code. I really distinctly remember seeing this line of code and thinking to myself, that we've got this node that has a node that has a node that has a node. And I, I really, I, I really honestly, I couldn't understand, like, how is this supposed to work if we just got nodes that just kind of keep going down and down and down and down like this? You have now spent, I don't know, two courses, three courses, three courses, two courses, at least two courses, kind of seeing and visualizing nodes like this. You've seen lots and lots of list structures now that look like this. When I first saw Java, when I first saw this idea of a list with nodes in it, I really couldn't get it. And it wasn't until I started thinking about pointers and how pointers work and how addresses work in memory that I was able to see this structure of a linear list of things. Pointers in Java are ultimately allowing us to enable this kind of a relationship. Let's talk about pointers in C and C++. In C and C++, pointers have an ex Pointers are explicit. We are explicitly referring to pointers. They have a specific type. Let's do some C++. I want to start going through building up a C++ example of a node. So something that we're sort of familiar with, but we're kind of going to be stomping all over the place in terms of C++ and how to use it and compile it and all sorts of different things. I ultimately want us to start building up a class in C++ that implements a node and then uses a bunch of different features of C++. All right, so first things first. Let's start by closing all the Java files because we don't need them anymore. I'm going to make a new file here. 
I'm going to call this file node.cpp. When I'm writing C++ code, I use the extension cpp to, to say that this is a C++ file. To create a class in C++, we're going to do some things that are fairly similar to Java. We're going to be using some of the same keywords that we're using in Java. But uh, we're also going to be starting to take a look at some of the uh, weird relationships between C and C++ in that we're going to have to use pointer types to refer to classes and, and instances of things in C++. So let's start by defining a class in C++. OK, done. We did it. We've declared a class in C++. There are two notable differences between Java and C++ right now. Three, I guess. The first one is we don't have to say public for our class type. We don't have to have an access modifier for this class right now. The second thing is that we don't have to call this file node.cpp with an uppercase n. We don't have to name it the same thing as the class that's inside this file. The third thing, and the most important thing, is that I put a semicolon at the end of this line. You have to have a semicolon after the end of this class declaration because it's, it's a statement in C++. So in Java, it's just like you've got this body of a method, and that's it. This body of a class, and that's it. In C++, you, it's a statement. You're declaring this class, and you're specifying a bunch of things inside of it. We've got some access modifiers. So in Java, we have public and private and protected. In C++, we have public and private and protected. One of the differences between Java and C++ is the way that we organize our attributes and methods inside of a class definition and the way that we uh, are um, separating them from each other. I want this class to have an int inside of it. It's going to be a private property. So I'm going to say private colon. And now we're going to have this group of things that are private to this class. So I'm going to say int data. I'm going to say node star next, a pointer to the next node, explicitly a pointer to the next node. I'm going to have some public things inside this class. So I don't repeat public and private for every different property. I just have sections. These are all the private things. These are all the public things in this class. The public things that I want to have in this class are two constructors. This is the null constructor. If we don't define a null constructor, it will be defined on our behalf. It's just something that comes for free with a class. The same thing is true in Java. If you don't define a constructor in a class, or if you don't define this null constructor, it will be defined on your behalf, and it just exists. I also want to have a node that takes int and node star. Similar to my Java node, I want to be able to have one that I can put data in it, and I can specify what the next pointer is. Similar to C, so when you're thinking about defining things, uh, declaring functions in C, so if you're thinking back to uh, 2160 and you've got your header file and you're declaring all your functions, you don't have to put the name of the argument inside the, definition, the declaration of the function. You just have to put the type that you want to accept there. I want to have another couple of things. So node pointer and get next. I want to be able to set next. And I want to be able to get data and set data. So 
So the major differences that we've got right now, we don't have to say that it's a public class. We can just say class. We don't have to name our file in a spe specific way. We just get to name it whatever we want. We have the semicolon at the end of our statement that's declaring our class. We have different sections for access modifiers. Instead of putting the access modifier on every single one of the properties and, and methods that we have for the class. And when we're declaring functions and methods and other things inside a class, we don't have to specify the name of the argument that we want to put in there. OK, great. This is my node, but it doesn't do anything. There's no method definitions in here. We have method declarations, but we don't have method definitions. I'm actually going to do uh, something outside here. I'm going to move this. I'm going to change the name of this file from node.cpp to node.h. I want this to be a header file. So I just, all, all I did here was change the name of this to be node.h instead of node.cpp. This part of my class is my interface. This is the interface to my class. This is declaring all of the methods that are part of this class without declaring what the methods actually are. I'm going to make a new file here, and this one I'm now going to call node.cpp. I want to have these defined in two separate files. And to my header file, I'm going to add an include guard, so pragma once. I don't want this to be imported multiple times or included multiple times in my C++ files. In my node.cpp, so on the left side, yeah, left side I've got node.h, and on the right side I've got node.cpp. Now I want to start actually defining what the methods are. So I'm going to start adding the implementation of those methods. When we create an implementation of a method in C++, we have to use kind of a weird looking syntax to do it. We start with the name of the class. So that's the very first thing I'm going to type is the name of the class that this method is attached to. I'm going to put two colons. So now this is saying this is the class name, colon, colon, and then we're going to put the name of the method that we want to define. So I want to define a constructor for my node type. This is that null constructor, the one that takes no arguments. I'm going to say in here this, so we use the same keyword this in C++ as we did in Java. I'm going to say this arrow data is equal to zero. So just some, some default value for my, for my data. And I'm going to say this next is equal to null ptr. This is a big difference from C. This is a big difference from C, and it's a difference from Java. In Java, we've got lowercase null. In C, we've got uppercase null. And in C++, we've got null ptr, null pointer. I want to add to this an implementation of my constructor that takes input. When we're declaring a method, or when we're defining a method that has uh, arguments, we now actually have to specify the names so that we can use them internally. So I'll say int data and node pointer next. And I'll say this data is equal to data, and this node next is equal to next. In C++, this is a pointer. The keyword this is giving you back a pointer. And as a small aside, when you were looking at, uh, when you were looking at things in, in C, I have to ask, I have to ask this. Um, did you see or learn the difference between using the arrow symbol and the dot symbol? Just thumbs up, please, if, if you did see that. OK, good, good. Then, I, then I won't, I'm not going to say anything about it. This is a pointer, so you have to use the arrow symbol. 
you're dereferencing it and then uh, accessing the property that's attached to that. So I'm going to keep going here. So node uh, get next. Node set next. Okay. On the left side, we have our interface. We have the interface. This is where us declaring the class and stating all the private and public members of that class. We're putting this in a header file because this is our interface. Header files are where we stick our interfaces. And then on the right side, we've got the implementation of the methods. Yep. Colon, colon, yeah. So the format that these have, is class name, colon, colon, and then method name. So this is us basically saying, I'm defining this method get next for the class that's named node. <laughs> you, you could, yes, you could. I would advise against it, uh, but you could, yes. You could definitely do that, yeah. The last thing that I want to do here is I want to include node.h. OK, quick show of thumbs. Uh, you know the difference between include with, with quotes versus include with angle brackets? Put thumbs down if you've never seen this before. OK, so the difference between include with angle brackets and include with double quotes is that the include with double quotes says include from the current directory. Include with angle brackets says include from the system directory. So wherever there are headers in the system, find them on the system path and use those. If you're using just uh, double quotes, this is using the current directory that you've got. OK. So this is great, but uh, we've got a problem here. How do we use this class? How do we actually use this class? C++ is this weird mix of C and OO stuff. The, the joke the joke of C++, the joke of C++, the terrible joke of C++ is C++ is C++1. Yeah, yes, hooray, yes, yes, ha, 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 yes. Computer scientists are terrible at jokes. C++ is C with objects. C++ is C with objects. C and a little bit more. In Java, I'm going to bring this bank back. In Java, we've got this class, public class. And then inside this class, we have this method that happens to be called main, public static void main string args. In Java, everything is part of a class. Ultimately, everything is part of a class, including the main method. In C++, the main function, so going back to C, it exists in and of itself. It's on its own. It's its own thing. I'm going to make one more file here today, and that file is going to be called main.cpp. You can call this whatever, whatever you want. You can call this whatever you want. I'm going to call it main.cpp. And in my main.cpp, I'm going to include node.h. I would like to include the interface for this node type so that I can actually use it. And then I'm going to create a main function. You've seen main declared like this before with void. Yes, no, no, OK, one no is enough. This says explicit, void in C explicitly says no arguments are allowed. If I were to just write int main like this, I could actually just pass as many arguments as I want to the function. 
Putting void in there says explicitly, I want no arguments to be passed to this. The important part is that it's called uh, main here. The function is called main. I'm going to return 0 at the end of this to say that my return is successful. And what I would like to do is create an instance of this class node. I'd actually like to be able to use this node, please. To create an instance of a node, I'm going to use this syntax node pointer. So I'm got a variable that's called node. Its static type is node pointer. It's a pointer to node. But unlike C, I can use the word new here. Unlike Java, I don't have to put parentheses at the end of this. This line is calling the null constructor. I'm not passing any arguments to my constructor call, so the null constructor is the one that's called. I can call other constructors in here. I can call other constructors and actually use the parenthesis there if I want to. OK, great. We've got a main function. We're declaring instances of this class node. We're calling constructors. The very last thing that I want to do is uh, I'd like to be able to compile and run this. So I'm going to open up um, a make file. I've been including these in all the samples that I give. They're just compiling your Java programs with, with make. I'm going to delete most of this for now because I want to just focus on the C++ part of it. When I give this to you as a sample, I'm going to have both the Java and the C++ mixed together in here. But uh, for later examples, when I'm doing just C++, I'll have it just be C++. OK. So in my make file, I'm going to make main. The all target, the very first target here, is the one that gets called by default or that gets run by default. I want to create main. Main depends on node.o. So I want node.o to be compiled into an object file, node.cpp to be compiled into an object file, and main depends on that. For my clean, I'd like to remove main and node.o. Going to do rm minus f here. I'm going to say cpp cxx is equal to clang plus plus. So if you were using clang for C before, you, know, you can clang plus plus. You can use clang plus clang plus plus to compile C plus plus programs. Oh, whoops! Oh my gosh! I'm really sorry. I forgot to put return types on all of my methods, all of them, every single one. That's terrible. I can't believe that. OK. Return type, the name of the class that we're implementing a method for, the name of the method that we're implementing, the arguments that that method accepts as input. I'm going to switch back to the make file really quickly here. This is maybe less than you've seen before in a make file. Uh, make knows how to do certain things like compile C++ programs. It knows how to do things like compile C programs. It's going to look around in my directory for a file named main.cpp, and it knows how to compile that. It's going to look around in my directory for a file that's named node.cpp, and it knows how to compile that into an object file. So I don't have to specify like the clang++ commands to do all of this. 
I'm going to put this up on the course webpage for you so that it is available, and we are going to keep working on that in, uh, in next class. That's it for today. Thank you all for coming out, and I will see you on Thursday. Bye, everyone.